Hello and welcome to Love Work Life Training Academy. And this week our topic is headhunting, the basics. Again, we've got a very, very full uh, agenda today with regards to people attending and what's going on. And we've got an hour to push it all in. So if you can hear me, please drop a quick note in the question bar or in the chat room, it'd be much appreciated. As always, as we start to log in, and lots of people are logging in now, which is great, as the numbers start to fly up, I'll start to sort of see who's here today. So we've got Austin Lee, we've got CRA Consulting, we've got Kensington Consulting, Change Recruitment, Judge Recruitment, we've got Aventus Legal, we've got uh, Capio Recruitment, we've got Westray Recruitment, Octopus, We've got uh, ARV Solutions, we have uh, G2 Group, we have Harper HR, TaylorMade, Exact Resourcing, we have uh, Expiris, we have Invictus, we have Pivotal uh, Recruitment, uh, uh, JSL Recruitment, we have, God, the list starts coming on as well, uh, TNN, Hall Recruitment, uh, Clara Rose Recruitment, Bonbon uh, Languages, um, ARV, Ignata, we have Brightmatch, God, how many else have we got today? Uh, we have uh, May and Stevens, we have uh, the MCS group, we have Star Recruitment, we have May and, uh, May and Stevens again, uh, we have Jobwise uh, in as well, and also we have lots of people from Hotmail, from Google, from uh, I messages etc also going in so presuming you people are people who are maybe on um, furlough etc but everyone is welcome so welcome to this week's session this week's session as I say is a request from last week uh, somebody dropped me an email last week and uh, as always the first person who came back to me I thought I'll have a look at what that goes on so I would give that you know first in best dress scenario and they said can you do something on head hunting and selling retainers now, also, I've done stuff on, quite a bit on selling retainers in the past, but we never sort of really touched on headhunting other than sort of skirted around the subject. So I've spent the week speaking to some ex-colleagues of mine, some people that I know who are uh, headhunters, uh, to get a true understanding of headhunting and a true understanding of the difference between headhunting and recruitment. Because a lot of recruiters think that headhunting is a recruitment is very, very similar. Now, there are lots of similarities, but there are huge, huge differences in how they deliver their service and the value that the clients perceive within their service. And that's the thing that I want to get over today, the value that is perceived. One of the people that I spoke to last week who's a uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, I won't say he's a friend, he's an acquaintance of mine, um, makes probably the sum total of between five and ten, yes that's five and ten placements a year. However, his average fee is over six figures. His lowest fee is 50k. So he spends his time in a very, very exclusive market in finance and banking, finding people to, to place into various different clients, headhunting and uh, placing people. As I say, he places between five and 10 people a year. But as you can see, looking at his average fee, which is over a hundred thousand pounds, you can see the quality that clients must engage with him and work with him when they start to place with him. So it's all about what you sell. He never works anything unless it is a retained piece of work and he's getting paid upfront for that piece of work. So headhunting the basics is what we're going to work on. As I said, I spent quite a lot of time this weekend or this week speaking to people. This weekend I, I spent a, time, a, a long weekend uh, in the Dales camping. Okay, and so sat down uh, on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon and started to write the course up and develop the course. And then yesterday, again, I just went back and cross and referenced certain things uh, with other people just to make sure that I've got absolutely right. And we're talking about the same things. So here we go. Headhunting. Okay, so the objects of this course really, okay, to look at what is headhunting. Why do clients require a headhunter? the difference between recruiters and headhunters, methods of headhunting, how to approach candidates, the key to headhunting, selling headhunting to clients, the mindset, and that's a really interesting thing, the mindset, okay? Selling retained services and working from there, okay? So 
What's his head hunting? Ah, and a nice square has appeared for some reason on my screen. I don't know where that's appeared from, but let's hope that doesn't uh, uh, cause any issues. So what is head hunting? And this is the first question that I really wanted to sort of get beyond to understand what head hunting actually is. And lots of con recruiters will think that their services are very similar to headhunting services. But what we've got to understand is what a headhunter actually gives to a candidate and to a client. They give a candidate and client a high class personal careers advice service. And that's to both parties. So when we say a high class careers advice service, clients tend to speak to them and candidates tend to go to them for advice. So they call and ask advice because they see the value in what these people actually do. And because they can see a value in what they do, they feel that they are part of their ecosystem when it comes to supply and demand of what they require. And because they give a very personalized service to these people, and we'll talk about this all the way through this process, they tend to go back to them time and time again. And they trust them. So trust is very high within that headhunting marketplace between clients, candidates and the consultants that they're working with. So we've got to start to think about that from a recruitment point of view. And if we start to think about recruitment, we start to talk about the 10 things that clients really want from recruiters. One of the things that they want is they want to create more trust and collaboration with the recruiter because they don't believe there's enough value there to carry on as they do at the moment. They create exclusive candidate pools. Now we always talk very much in recruitment about the passive market and building passive marketplaces. Well, when we're talking to headhunters about creation of a candidate pool, they genuinely create and know their candidates inside out. They talk and create candidate pools based on their clients' exacting needs and again we're going to talk about that a little bit later on so it's a very 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 different way to what we do we speak to a candidate and we put them in our passive pool and maybe speak to them once a month maybe if we're lucky twice yeah once every couple of months these guys are in touch in an awful lot they are in touch in many different ways not just the phone and lots of different things the way they market and the way they engage with their candidates is very very different to the way we do so their candidate journey is a very different experience from the candidate's point of view. And again, we'll look at that later on. They have access to candidates that the clients have not seen before and potentially cannot find from anywhere else. And again, because they spent an awful long time building their candidate pools, they can genuinely go to clients and say that to clients. And they can genuinely have that conversation with candidates. And what you tend to find is that the candidates and the clients marketplace, the head onto marketplace, actually blends together because lots of the clients were candidates of the headhunter at one time or another and what they were doing with that candidate experience and how they felt that candidate experience has led them to drive that ongoing relationship and creating a more in-depth relationship than a recruiter normally has with either the client or the candidate. They provide candidates and clients with a genuine choice and this is a really interesting comment because um, we again believe that we provide candidates and clients with genuine choice. But it's interesting when I go and see um, clients and, and when I'm talking clients, I'm talking about uh, recruitment agencies in the main because I don't really deal that often with um, search companies. But when I go and see businesses and I start to look at agencies and I start to talk about what they're doing and I start to talk about how many candidates have you got with multiple interviews that's multiple interviews in different clients. And usually the answer is not very many. How many clients have you got where you've got candidates on multiple interview, i.e. you've filled all their, their slots? And usually you get a few more of those. But again, it's usually one on one, one candidate with an opportunity, or you've got one candidate in a client with an opportunity. Headhunting is about providing a choice. OK, so it's about being consultative and giving consultative choices to the client. So they talk about the marketplace. They understand the marketplace. They're very reactive to the marketplace and they get paid on what they actually do. So they're not just recruitment. This is headhunting. So there's a similarity in between them and where they go. So what we've got to start to think about as we start to expand this conversation 
is hows and the whys and the differences and then start to think about how you can put this into your recruitment process and let me say here and now if you're a 360 recruiter and you think that you can go and sell genuine headhunting to a client and remain a 360 recruiter then you're misguided to be a headhunter you have to differentiate your business model hugely compared to what most recruitment agencies do if you're a 360 recruiter yes you can provide in inverted commas a headhunting service it is just more of a glorified recruitment service compared to what a headhunter organization actually does and there's things that we need to learn from them and when we sort of learn from the headhunters they do a very similar process to us they obviously interview candidates they take job specifications from clients, they match the two together, and they go to make a placement. And that is basically what we do. It's basically what they do. But there are lots of different idiosyncrasies within that marketplace that do differentiators. So remember, if you're a 360 recruiter, think about what you can learn from these comments and think about what you can apply to your own marketplace. If you're a manager or a director of a business and you're thinking about supplying headhunting services to your clients, Think about what you can do with your model to change your model to create value. And this is all about the value creation chain because what headhunters do is they provide value to their clients. And that is why the client pays them upfront an inordinate amount of money and their average percentage fees around about 30 percent as i said the guys that i've been speaking to one was averaging over 100k on his average fee you can start to see there's a huge difference so why do clients require headhunters this again is very simple but very interesting okay they want to fill a key position now we go and talk to clients about filling key positions but when we talk about headhunting it is about understanding that key position and understanding what that key position actually is all about. And with the further up the recruitment chain you get, i.e. from a salary perspective, you've got to start to think about the impact that those managers have on the business. And sometimes when it's a key position to fill, it's about changing the culture of a business. It's about changing the working strategy of a business. So they are very strategic appointments rather than just a key appointment. It is a very different appointment where we're putting at a high level manager manager in or maybe a director in headhunters are putting c-suite level people into a company and therefore it is a key appointment and it is sometimes about changing the direction of a business and how that works clients require a sensitive approach when we say sensitive approach they may be looking to maneuver someone out of their business and therefore they want to make sure that they have a replacement instantly for that person so being sensitive to that approach is really important. So they want to make sure they can trust somebody that could go out into the marketplace and headhunt very quietly a replacement for a position. Generally, in these type of marketplaces, most people know each other. So it's really important that sensitivity is key, a part of your strategy when looking at delivering headhunting. Obviously, they come to you when there is a lack of candidates within the marketplace, which is exactly the same as they do for a recruitment point of view. But they have a pointed view of what they want. And the lack of people in their marketplace is because their marketplace is very small and very niche. And therefore, they need to get either look at different ways or different marketplaces to attract people from and look at how behaviours become more important than skills. A lot of the headhunting is based around the behavioural profiling of candidates rather than the skill matching of candidates. And it's interesting to see, to give you an idea of how that works. So um, when I was at Deco, we had a new country manager come in, had zero recruitment skills, but had huge business intellect. He was the head of Vodafone for the whole of Europe, etc. This person came in, yes, wasn't great at the recruitment strategy, but he had people around him that could deliver that type of strategy. Business strategy though, and changing the cultural strategy, which I think he was brought in to do, that is what his key problem uh, priorities were. And therefore it was a different type of person. Some clients, clients have target clients or candidates that they want you to approach formally. So again, as a recruiter, 
how often does a client come to you and say, well, I want you to go approach John Smith who works for so-and-so, so-and-so, because I want to work for me, okay? Not very often. In fact, I've had, had very seldom seen that or even heard that in the recruitment market. Why? It's because that trust isn't there. They don't feel it's worth paying our services to go and do that because they don't trust the way that we work. So we have to work on that really hard. And yet they go to headhunters constantly and do that. Clients require absolute discretion when approaching candidates. And that is a very, very interesting thing. We've all heard horror stories about candidates working with recruiters and all of a sudden their manager receives a, a, a reference request, et cetera, et cetera, on their desk and the guy hasn't even left. You know, we need to make sure that we are the most discreet type of organizations in the world, almost clandestine to some degree, to make sure we give absolute discretion to our candidates, but also to our clients. It's important that we look at that. And that's very different from being sensitive. Being discreet is even more important. The real client requires a more in-depth recruitment process to ensure the mark has been genuinely covered. Looking at studies of clients, one of the things they said, they want to place the person first time, not in the quickest time. So headhunters will be very open about the timescales and about how the recruitment process works. They want to make sure that the recruitment process matches what the client actually needs. They will tailor their process to each individual client and work on that. The fact that they're working exclusive means they have time to do those type of things. The fact that we work in competition in the main, in that contingency space, means we can't afford to do that. And in general, we're afraid to push back to a client and try to challenge their recruitment process, even though most clients want a more efficient recruitment process, where a headhunter seems to have more free reign. Why? Because the headhunter seems to spend more time speaking to the C-suite and has the ear of the C-suite. And they have long-standing relationships with a C-suite member. And therefore, they can influence a company more than most recruiters can. Because most recruiters in the main, we do not have the ear of the C-suite properly, the ear of the C-suite. So the difference between headhunting and recruiters is very simple. And we're going to go through this in a different number of ways and how these work. Headhunters act as career mentors. They mentor candidates and they mentor clients. And certain clients will go back to headhunters constantly to help find people for their business, but also when they are looking to move, they will come back to you. Now, how many people have we placed in our lifetime as a recruiter and how often does that candidate come back to you when they want another job? Yes, they do at some degree, but not in the degree that they come back to a headhunter because they've created a true relationship and they do become genuine career mentors to their clients and to their candidates. They offer a high touch point candidate journey. And it's important, the candidate journey is the most important part of the recruitment process for any recruiter or any search or any headhunting organization. Why is the journey so important? Because your candidate becomes your biggest selling, I suppose, your biggest salesperson in your organization. Because as they walk onto a site, they are talking about the level of service they have received from the headhunter, how they have felt and how they've been engaged all the way through the recruitment process. They're also probably selling to the client that they've just left, the reasons why you should be using this person as a headhunter. And it was interesting speaking to the headhunters I spoke to, all of them said a vast majority of their work are filling the positions where they've just taken someone from because the client will come back to them because the candidate is singing their praises. So it's a very grown up situation compared to recruitment where sometimes we're almost embarrassed to ring a client where we've just taken a candidate from because we feel they're gonna you know, we are Beelzebub and we have taken your, their, their, their candidate away from them. The top end of the market doesn't seem to see it that way. 
They understand that the market is moving around and people move around the market for various different reasons. And it's about the touch point journey that the candidate gets that makes them want to go back and reuse that service and engage that service either as a candidate or a client. As we said, they build exclusive candidate pools over long periods of time using very proactive methods. They are constantly engaged in the marketplace, looking for candidates they think would be right for the clients that they already have engaged with and worked with in the past, but also potential new clients that they can open up. They spend an awful long time, and as I said, long periods of time building candidate pools. And when we talk about their recruitment processes and what they do that's different to recruitment, then we can understand how they manage to keep these, these candidates in sync how they keep in touch with these candidates constantly but proactively they are always looking for candidates they are always interviewing and to them whether you're a client or a candidate you are a candidate and they look at it in that method headhunters are key influencers in their niche marketplace and when i say key influencers in their marketplace when they say they have met and they meet on a regular basis, CEOs of the top five, you know, top 100 FTSE companies, et cetera, et cetera, they are genuinely meeting with those people. They are genuinely influencing those people and influencing what those people do. So they work at a very different level to our recruitment sort of organization. And we talk about this an awful lot when we talk about level selling. But most recruiters are speaking to line managers, recruitment managers, team leaders, HR, etc. Headhunters aren't speaking at that level. They're not working at that level. They are working at a really high end market where they can influence the market. And again, to give you an idea, when I was at Computer People, we had a contract with the government uh, to supply consultant, uh, IT consultants into the government. And I was building a part of the business and working from there. And I built a headhunting operation. And I wanted to build a headhunting operation that said we could go on the back of all our key accounts. And the government was obviously a huge key account for us. You know, we had other good offices like Fujitsu and uh, BA, etc. And the idea was that this little team would be going in and creating sweet, sweet relationships so they could headhunt out of that. And it was really interesting going into the government bodies and speaking to the top government officials and talking about headhunting. Their simple answer was, we didn't know you did that. We weren't and thought you were in that marketplace. We thought you were in the recruitment marketplace, which is to them putting bums on seats. So they have a very different view of what recruitment market is to what a headhunting market is. So again, you have to speak to the influencers in the marketplace so you can actually influence the marketplace. Headhunters locate and court niche passive candidates based on exacting client briefs. And again, we've talked about an exacting client brief. We talk about taking good quality justifications these guys spend days building exacting briefs for their clients and then hunt niche passive candidates for that. And headhunting have a true in-depth knowledge of their candidate base and marketplace, and they provide their clients with that knowledge. If a client wants to make a better decision, they need due diligence on that marketplace. They need to understand what the market is actually talking and doing at that moment in time. They need to understand what the candidate has been doing and truly what they've been doing and what impact that candidate has so they can make a better decision. So knowledge of the candidate base and the market is really important. And I always think a good recruiter and the good recruiters I've met have got good, good knowledge of the marketplace, but it's not in depth. We are not talking to the influence of the marketplace to really do that. So we move on to sort of methods of headhunting and what those methods of headhunting look like. So methods of headhunting are very, very straight and simple. A client engages a headhunter exclusively. Now we talk about exclusive work and most of our exclusive work is work that we undertake that is still free of charge. 
A headhunter's exclusive work is always paid. They are always paid for their engagement and their, of their services. Headhunters always do a pre-search. And when we talk about a pre-search, it's very different to us. They discuss with their clients, target clients to headhunt from. They also discuss and provide candidates that are already known to them via prior searching and working what they've done so they know their marketplace and they will always have candidates they can instantly start to introduce to that client. Now that introduction is very different to our type of introduction. Our introduction is normally to try to get a candidate a position within that client. Their introduction of that candidate to that client is to acid test the capabilities of the job specification that they've taken to make sure it can attract the right candidate. So they will use candidates sometimes as an acid test to rebuild the job specification to understand what it is. Now, if it, that known candidate is the right type of candidate, then obviously they push that candidate through. But they're looking at the candidate in a very different way that they use that candidate to push into that client to really build their candidate knowledge, but also to build that knowledge of the requirement they've taken. They advise on packages and benefits to attract and retain the best clients. And that word advise is really straightforward. We as recruiters, we've used recruitment consultant, and I've talked about this on all my webinars at mostly that a lot of people, that con bit is what is important because people recruitment con sultan and lots of clients think we con them headhunters advise so they don't always use the word consultancy in fact very seldom do they use the word consultancy they use consultative approach but they advise their clients on what's going on they advise how to go to the market they advise the type of people they should be speaking to because they are trusted to give that type of advice and the C-suite will listen to them if they get that advice right and have done for other companies and they can demonstrate that. So headhunting is an advisory service rather than a consultative service. And there's a distinct difference about how we provide that. They draw up target searches for exclusive candidates for their researchers to engage. And again, I'm going to go back to this word researcher further in the, in the presentation. Because remember, at the start, we said, if you're a 360 recruiter and you think that you are going to provide a true headhunting service to a client, you're not. You need to make sure that you engage in your marketplace properly and give a service that is a scene of value to your client. And therefore, having researchers working in the candidate marketplace constantly is an absolute must. And a researcher, let me tell you now, is not a resourcer. In my experience, a resourcer is the first step of the ladder in a recruitment business. And then they move out of resourcing into sales or further up the line of resourcing. Researchers in a headhunting organization are highly skilled recruiters using their skills to find candidates. They are highly paid for what they do. Network and using exclusive networks to generate referrals. So every person they speak to is an opportunity to get a referral to somebody else. And they network extensively through the marketplace and they use their networks. So they'll go to certain people, either candidates or clients, and get them to introduce them to those people. We talk about doing this an awful lot. They were doing what LinkedIn was designed to do way before LinkedIn was designed linking in with each other and networking in with each other because their network is so strong and a network of really good clients and candidates is a very powerful place if you are the headhunter and you are the influencer in there so clients will give you information because they want to try and influence the market themselves knowing full well that you as the headhunter can certainly influence that for them so they go back to them time and time and time again using that network finding other people that may be not on the radar, but should be on the radar. And obviously headhunters interview all candidates face to face. It's a very simple comment and it's a very easy throwaway comment, but do we really do it? Even in the age of Zoom and Teams, etc., interview, Odro, 
do we truly interview our candidates face to face? When our headhunters interview our candidates face to face, again, I'll talk about a little bit later, it's a very different experience. So how do candidates to approach candidates? And again, this is a very different way of thinking. First impressions count. I'm a headhunter. We've identified you as a key person to approach for our clients. Flattery goes an awful long way. I am a headhunter and I've experimented this with lots of recruiters and they've changed their terminology to go on saying, I am a headhunter. It's massively different the feeling that a candidate gets when they feel that they are being headhunted. If they feel that someone actually wants and has identified them, it makes them feel so much better. So you are massaging their ego, you are flattering them, which means they'll open up a little bit more. They'll spend some more time and listen to you. So remember, these people are happy in their current positions and not looking to move. So sometimes we need to be honest. And as recruitment, we're classed as never truly being honest. A headhunter will thrive on their honesty and they'll thrive on their calmness and their ability to do various different things. So they approach it. I appreciate this call you were not expecting. And you might be surrounded by your colleagues. And so they're opening up, saying, look, I know you might be surrounded, you might not be able to speak. So they're trying to give their candidate an opportunity to say to them, I can't really speak at the moment, can you call me later? But they're aligning that, where as recruiters, and I've trained this as a recruiter, we tend to try and ignore that because we want to speak to the candidate, come what may. They have a hook, why they are calling them, and they are making it personal to that candidate. And it's interesting, they have a hook and the hook will be, they know some things that the candidate has done and they know what the client is looking for and they'll match those things together to try create that desire and that hook instantly, very, very quickly, before they go through the interview process. And there's a long interview process that's going to happen when you get into the headhunting process. The state that they appreciate that they are currently not looking. But they state the call is in confidence. It is a confidential call. Discretion that we've talked about is really important to the candidate marketplace at this level. They give their candidates enough information, as we said, to create interest and intrigue. I'm a headhunter, exclusively working for a leading market player, and your name keeps coming up. These type of little throwaway comments are what is called the ego approach to recruitment. It massages people's egos and it makes them want to listen. So changing simple words, hi, I'm a recruiter and I've identified you, says you've been looking on LinkedIn. Hi, I'm a headhunter and I've identified you, says I've been searching for you, I've been looking for you. And now I've identified you and I've been asked to approach you it has a very different connotation. That simple change of that simple word means so many different things. So we think about our terminology when we're speaking to clients and we're speaking to candidates because the words that we use sometimes become really important. You need to make sure that you've got lots of information on your candidate and you use it during the call. If you know more about your candidate than your candidate is expecting, and that's not just reading a, a a CV or a LinkedIn profile is genuinely going out and finding out about that candidate. It creates intrigue. How did you know? Who's put you in touch? Who's given you that information? I've been headhunted an awful lot and I always find those questions really intriguing. When they know something about me, which I haven't put on a CV or I haven't put on LinkedIn or something like that, how do they know that? Who are they talking to? Because remember, they build really good connected marketplaces and they use their marketplace to get information that they can use they do not use recruitment terminology i'm keen to open up a discussion about your future they're not talking about jobs they never go on initially to talk about a job even though they may have a job in mind or a client in mind they go on to talk about the candidate's future because remember they are mentors to these candidates, career mentors. 
They like to talk to them. They'll suggest coffees and teas, and they'll work in that way to bring candidates more on side, to get to know them, to get understand them. They want to get to know their candidates far better because they feel more comfortable putting a candidate forward that they've met on numerous occasions, not just once. We may meet a candidate and interview them, and then we put them forward. We still don't really know that candidate very, very well. These headhunters go out of their way to understand their candidate market, candidates and understand the candidate marketplace really well. They always send concise emails why they want to meet and they start stating key selling points, but they don't waffle. They use their ability to be to the point and because they feel that they have the market respect, they can be very pointed with some of their comments where at recruitment sometimes I think we shy away some of those comments because we're a little bit scared to make those comments. So they only send an email to them, but to them, they make that email personal. We send blanket emails out, generic emails out in recruitment constantly. I know I've done it constantly because we think it saves time and it saves money, okay? Headhunting isn't about saving time and saving money. It's about finding the right candidate. So every approach is personal. Every approach is very different. So the key to headhunting is very different. Ah, we've lost our square. Good, we're back to, back to normal. Sorry about that square. I don't know where that came from, ladies and gents. Uh, some technical malfunction somewhere in there, PowerPoints, but there you go. Um, so the key to headhunting, and what headhunting actually looks like. Product is really important to headhunting. And what they do is they leverage their existing contacts constantly. The key to headhunting is being able to nurture those contacts and nurture them for an awful long time because they never know when you're actually going to need that contact. So headhunters are constantly in touch with their candidate database and their client database. They never have a peak and trough. They're always having peaks because they're constantly looking at what's going on. And yes, they reverse market candidates out to clients, but they are very precise. They're not just blanketing these guys out, even sending it to five clients. It is one candidate to one client, and it's a whisper of what's going on in the marketplace. And it's always with the consent of the candidate. So they leverage their existing contacts, both candidates and clients constantly, and they nurture them. Knowledge is really important, as I talked to, uh, spoke about earlier on. They are experts in their client marketplace. What they're also good at, if they don't succeed, they try. If your first call or email request goes unanswered, they have a follow-up strategy. They don't just ignore it and look to find the next person that's available. They carry on. They have reasons to call the candidate and the reason hasn't changed just because the candidate hasn't responded. So they'll continue trying to find that candidate and build that candidate relationship. So they don't give up and they have lots of tactics that are different to just sending a LinkedIn message to somebody. They have lots of different ways to get hold of people that we should really be doing. And in the old days of recruitment, we did quite a few of them, but we've seemed to have forgotten because we've become keyboard warriors. You might not have a direct number, because most of LinkedIn hasn't got a direct number. But you know where they work. And so headhunters call people at work. Why? Because they want to make an impact. I'm calling you at work. Recruiters only call at work if they know the number. A headhunter will call through anybody. They'll go through the switchboard, etc. But they'll be discreet. They'll be professional. They appreciate that people may be listening and they will work on that from there. It's very interesting. You can sit in an office and I can know when a rex to rex calling my consultants because they're in a very different way of working. OK, and you can see what the conversation is going on. However, when a headhunter calls them, I never truly know whether it's a headhunt call or whether it's somebody else because the headhunter is very good at disguising that type of call. And they build relationships that last and that is important because a lot of these candidates become clients and vice versa so having a lasting relationship is really important and if you upset the apple cart at this level it tends to cascade very very quickly 
and everybody knows that. So sometimes headhunters are made and broken by some of the things that they have done during the recruitment process. We need to think about that and what's going on. So timing is important. Know your marketplace and know your potential targets. They know when to stop. They know when to stop working with clients, but they also know how to stop working with clients and still retain dignity and regain a potential fee afterwards. Consistency is really important. Headhunters can take months, if not years, so they are persistent. They are consistent in their approach, constantly building and building and building their marketplace. They keep in touch on a regular basis. And I mean keep in touch, but they use multiple ways to keep in touch. How many guys market into your database constantly? How many people market with a personal message to people? How many people send a written note, etc.? All sorts of different things. How many times do I, have, I still receive, I've got one headhunter and I still receive a birthday card and I've moved three times. Bizarre. I don't know how he knows I've moved, but he knows I've moved. And I still get a birthday card and I have been for about the last 15 years. Okay. Interesting. But they keep in regular touch. They talk with authority. They never bullshit. They talk with genuine authority. And because they feel trusted in the marketplace and clients generally trust them and candidates trust them, they can be very authoritative all the time because they are trusted advisors. Recruiters want to be trusted advisors to clients Headhunters want to be trusted advisors to candidates and to clients. And therefore, there's a different position for them. And they meet every candidate face to face. And what they do for the, both the candidates and the clients, they build and increase the employer's branding and the candidate's employment value proposition. So they're always building that constantly because they want to make sure that their clients and their candidates are seen the same light in the marketplace. So when selling headhunting to clients, we've got to think about the better quality of candidates that we can produce. A genuine personal candidate database means that you can create instantly an opportunity of a long list for a client to review. Once the client reviews that long list, not only can you review the candidates, but you can also review the job specification. So selling that means that if we can review the, that client and give them a list almost immediately, then it means that we can start to penetrate the market quickly for the candidate, for the client, which means that they will get a better quality of candidate. It's not the first candidate fastest past the post. It will be the best candidate past the post in the time it takes to get that candidate past the post. And this is about setting expectations with clients, which we'll talk about. Better candidate quality. So it's a better cultural understanding, skill match, track record. And as we said, it's about the EVP. We have a large candidate pool. So they are genuine niche specialists and have large passive marketplaces that they take candidates from. So when selling that to clients, they can prove that instantly. And they've almost got a candidate list, long list designed straight away. They have existing defined networks to hunt from. They work with a tighter recruitment process that creates value. And that's by submitting the perfect candidate initially. So what they do is they'll say, look at these candidates in a long list. Let's talk about these candidates and talk about them generically. And then they can then tailor this job specification down, which means they will only submit potentially one, two, at the very outside, three candidates for that role, never more than three, mainly two. Quite often, it is just only one. The counter offer management is intensified hugely because obviously there's a huge level, at, uh, well, there's a huge amount at stake at this level and they want to make sure that the candidates aren't bought back. A lot of candidates at this level use this as a real negotiating tool because remember, they're at the top of the tree. So loyalty is a very different thing from someone further down the line. It's obviously very more cost effective. So you're only dealing with one agency and it saves time. You get a better quality candidates and less dropouts and you spend less time interviewing rubbish candidates. So again, when selling this to clients, it is about their time. It is about increasing the tenure of their staff because if you can recruit the right person, it is about lower staff turnover, better attrition, 
But if we can really sort that out for our clients, that's one of the things that we talk about when we talk about 98% of all clients want to reduce recruitment costs. That does not say recruitment fees. It says recruitment costs. So we need to make sure that we can look at that. So we might be able to charge more, but if their tenure is longer, then we're in a better position. A better match obviously increases the onboarding process. It makes employees more profitable quickly. And if people are changing market direction, et cetera, it means the company becomes a better organization and becomes more profitable quickly or creates more profit. Okay. And we must reduce the risk of a bad hire. So the difference between headhunting and contingency is very straightforward. Headhunting, 360, do all the work in the main. Absolutely we do. We sometimes give that out to a resourcer, but usually that is the small person, the first person, the last person into the business, sorry, okay, and they're usually working multiple roles. We work for free, constantly work for free. We have lots of competition all the time, and we work in a very competitive market. We source candidates from the active marketplace rather than the passive marketplace. We prefer, for some reason, to advertise on job boards rather than going to our database and groom our database properly and develop a, a database properly. We work on the fastest candidate past the post wins rather than just the best candidate for the job. We present most of our CVs by email or now by, by uh, video, depending on what we're doing from, uh, working from. And most of our work is undertaken via the phone. And the UK average is that we fill two out of 10 roles. Headhunters, on the other hand, they work in teams. They have researchers. I'm going to talk about that a little later on. They have requirement managers and they have headhunters or consultants, depending on what they work, but they're generally called headhunters. They get paid before they engage in their process. They work exclusively with all clients. They never advertise on job boards. Now, that's not to say they never advertise, which is why I've uh, um, asterisked that. So they'll put adverts in the Times, the Telegraph, in important press, but generally stay away from job boards. They want to go to the end, luxury end of the marketplace. They have exclusive, highly networked candidate pools and they vet every candidate and client face-to-face -face before engaging. And the word there that we need to focus on is vet. They vet the client and they vet the candidate and their decision whether they work with them or not. Where we very seldom vet our clients and very seldom vet our candidates properly, we will work with anybody who provides a job if we feel it's worth working. They only submit the very best candidates after a face-to-face interview with the client so they will take the client the candidates to the client paper video etc and present them face to face they won't just send them and hope people stick they get involved in the interview process they take the offer from the client and give the offer to the candidate face to face and they fill 90 percent of all their roles so what does headhunting actually look like this is what I was described and how it looks like. So at the bottom, you've got your resource, your research model, your resource model. They spend all time in the marketplace speaking to candidates, developing a candidate marketplace. They know everybody. And that resource and research is hunting out detailed information that the headhunter can use. The next person is that account manager. That account manager is the person that's liaising with the client and liaising with the candidates on interviews, setting interviews up, making sure that all, both parties are serviced with everything they need to make sure everything runs smoothly. This is the person that links together everything that's going on. You then have your headhunter, and your headhunter is the person that does all the negotiation. So when we think about that, your candidate is at the front line. So the resource is on the front line of the marketplace finding candidates. Your account manager, is your candidate and client care and your headhunter is the person that is involved in the negotiation with the candidate and the client so all three parties are involved in the recruitment process and when you push those two uh, triangles pyramids whatever you want to call them together they create a very solid square so although the headhunting side 
looks a little bit unbalanced with the resource points down. But when you push it together, you suddenly see the value that each party has to each other. Equal value. One party can't work without the other. And this is where our 360 falls down compared to headhunters. Why we only place two out of 10 compared to them placing nine out of 10. So we need to think about that. So the mindset of a headhunter is very, very different. The mindset of a headhunter is all about belief. They have belief with what's going on. They are very, very consultative. And when we talk about consultative, we talk about advisory. So I've written that word. And yet this morning on the conversation, we changed it to advisory. And so I should have changed it there. Headhunters are very calm under pressure. And at this level, you need to pro project an aura of sort of calm and confidence that impresses high level candidates and high level clients. They never over promise to either party and they conduct their business in a calm and approachable but unauthoritative way. It's a long term view. So they want to be unceasing desire. They have an unceasing desire to find the best candidates. So a headhunter head head cannot sort of risk presenting an underqualified candidate in a very competitive market. And if you think about getting paid £100,000 for a placement, it is a competitive market, although it's very few people in that market. So they never stop searching and interviewing the cream of the crop. So it's a long-term view. They understand they need a, tiff, a tough skin because unlike recruitment, they have a very high tolerance for rejection. Now we talk about this and we talk about our bounce back ability. We talk about our tenacity and things like that. Many of their potential clients and candidates will refuse offers. And when you're talking hundred thousand pounds, you've got to be very tough. They'll be willing to take you and find out what it is and go no further. So they'll listen to you and they'll take you all the way and then decide they want to pull out all certain candidates. So you have to be very good with your candidate marketplace. They use you for a bargaining tool for salaries, etc., And they might even actually come along and just for a free lunch and things like that. So you need to understand because you don't want to be less feeling the fool in front of your client. So you need to be able to actually identify the candidates that you want. So never fear rejecting your candidates yourself. And headhunters will pull candidates out because they don't think it's worthwhile then. And so then they start again thinking about that long-term view. Okay, It's about rejecting talent, but realizing that you're going to want to use that talent later. So rejecting it in a professional way. Every person they meet has to be added to their talent pipeline. You need to be very good at talent mapping and remembering all your contacts for future roles. No company likes to lose their star employee to a headhunter. And headhunters sometimes suffer from sort of negative reputation as we do, that they've stripped somebody out. However, in those senior circles, headhunting is considered as part of business life. And very often the same companies who've lost the employee will have engaged the headhunter to fill the next role. As long as we operate in a maximum discretion, we don't overcommit and we don't do the cardinal sin poaching from our own clients, we will flourish as headhunters because networking becomes a skill. And networking, they never stop networking. They know exactly who they're talking to and they're brilliant at small talk. They are brutally honest constantly to their clients. They know they are their industry inside out and they know what's going on with the industry inside out. So they're abreast of the trade news, employee movement, the trends in the marketplace. They utilize social media, Google, trade magazines, etc. They are always reading everything because they want to be brutally honest with their clients. They are always on a charm offensive. Many people will be deeply flattered by an approach by a headhunter. And it's about the headhunter's job getting them over the line. But their approach initially is by the researcher, then the headhunter etc. So it's everything that's involved in the process. So controlling people's expectations is really important. Some clients will be flattered that being been approached. So we need to make sure that the deal is done and get them over the line. So that means listening is really important to the headhunter. 
listening and be involved in approaching passive candidates and understanding what they want. So as the researcher will have spoken to them, the headhunter will have spoken to them maybe once, if not twice, if not three times, and met them before the candidate goes forward. So it means that they're listening all the time for potential opportunities that the candidate may pull out, but listening for things that's going on constantly. They are discreet, and it's crucial that the entire recruitment industry starts to be more discreet, and in particular so in headhunting when it's senior positions. So we need to make sure that we are doing the right things. Headhunting is highly pressurised and it will pay off if we do the right things, but we've got to make sure we do the right things constantly. So what does our recruitment process look like compared to headhunting? Okay, so I put this up a couple of weeks and we changed it. Headhunters market penetration is huge and they throw all that market penetration into their funnel. Their candidate market development is huge and their client development is small because they only work with a very small handful of clients where we work with lots of clients. They work with a handful of clients, but a massive amount of candidates. And then their actual process is very different. It's an engagement process that they're paid to engage. They create long lists, they create short lists, they create interviews, they manage the offer and they manage the placement. So it's not just similar to our recruitment process at all. In fact, it's very similar, but how they go into individual parts is very different because individual people deal with different parts of that. When I put this site up last time, it was 80-20. 80% of the time was lost because we only make 20% of the deals where they are saying 10% of the time that they work only gives them 10% of the profit, or they've lost that 10% where 90% of the time that they work creates 90% of their profit. So 90% of the time that they're working creates their 90% of their profit, which is an infinitely better place to be rather than working for 80% of your time that only creates 20% of your profit, or we look at that properly, 20% of your time that creates 80% of your profit. So we've got to think about the possibilities of what we need to be doing. And again, this is taken from the, the recruitment thing, okay? So we review our client base. So we review the cash cows. How regularly are we speaking to the C-suite? Are we talking to the C-suite on a constant basis? When we prospect clients based on our candidate quality, not based on what we can provide to the client. So we they approach clients based on the quality of the candidates that they have. They never engage with problem clients. If a client's a problem or doesn't want to listen to how they work, they do not engage with them. Review the candidate database. Passive candidates, they know who's serious and they fully interview these people constantly. They'll have interviewed them maybe three or four times. They're active marketplace. They know who is great. They know who is not. They have a CRM and they grade it and they mark it and this is their king tool. When you go and talk to a search agency about what their primary tool is, it is their candidate marketplace. They grade their clients on engagement value. Now we have this slide up before that we look at 20% of clients review or sack, 80% we develop and 20% we look to develop or expand. Headhunters do exactly the same. I was very surprised to find that they do exactly the same. They look at clients they sack, clients they should be developing and clients they should be expanding. And they do it in a way that they want to make sure that they maximize their time. 90% of their time is about making money and is making money. 10% is not. We are 80% of our time is about making 20% of our money. So we need to think about that. I've shown this slide and I showed this slide to one of the guys. And he just described it very, very quickly, which I know described it to you very, very quickly. Time and money, the dots are clients. Low time invested, high client profit. They do not invest in those clients. Low time investment, low profit. They do not invest in those clients. High time investment, low profit. They do not invest in those clients. High time investment, big profit. They invest in those clients. But these are their cash cows, different to our cash cows. They look at cash calves and look at how they're going to develop cash calves and they only work in this golden area. They do not work in other areas. Why? Because the clients that are outside those areas will come to them because of their reputation and what they do. 
So we've got to think about that. We have to build that marketplace as a recruiter. They have built it on the reputation of the service they provide, the discretion that they provide, and word of mouth. So it's a real different marketplace. They turn away the clients that cause them pain so they can spend 90% of their time making money. I started to look at this, and again, I showed this to them, and this is exactly the same. They want a better service. They have a digital process. They have behavioral focus. They have client marketing. They have video. They have onboarding. They have AI and pre-screens. It's candidate, candidate, candidate. That's exactly the same thing that we try to sell to our clients, but they do it in a far better way because they have the gravitas of that true understanding of their marketplace to actually sell to their clients. They compartmentalize their sell. Contingency, they never even sell it. They don't even talk about contingency. Exclusive business, they don't ever entertain it. Retained 100% of the time and recruitment services based purely on need because most of their business or all their business is 100% retained. So they don't entertain anything else. Their perceived value to clients and to candidates is very different to our perceived value. So when we talk about how we pitch our clients, again, they pitch in a very straightforward way because they are being brutally honest. They change how they pitch. They still like us pitching blocks. They make their candidate client decide on their strategy and then they tailor their strategy and price accordingly to that strategy. Now, when we look at our strategy, they do not entertain the contingency and the exclusive. They do all of those things, except in the job board advertising in the name, but they do the retained part and they get part paid for that and they get fully paid for some of their recruitment solutions that they provide. So they are very, very, very confident about how they provide their solutions and their solutions are no different to ours. They haven't got anything different to what we have as a recruiter, except the way they are perceived in the marketplace. So to conclude, headhunters is like recruitment, it is only more refined. Headhunters give clients and candidates an extremely high touch point service. Clients pay to engage a headhunter service 100% of the time. Headhunter's methods are more targeted and more in-depth than a contingency model. And the headhunter creates a very different, or headhunter treat candidates, sorry, very differently to recruiters. We look at short-term, they look at long-term. And their strategic sell for headhunting services, which should not ever be blended with a contingency recruitment. So we start to think about what we do and we start to think about the differences that we've talked about in the last hour between contingency and headhunting or recruitment and headhunting and then start to look at how you can tailor that into your marketplace and into your business and into your sale. You'll start to understand that if you create value, which is what a headhunter tends to do is create value, then price becomes no objection and service becomes paramount. So service levels are key, and that's what we're moving to. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Just over the hour, sorry for creeping over the hour. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that's given you a better insight on headhunting and how you can apply some of those techniques and maybe tailor some of your services to do that. But remember, if you're going to do pure headhunting, it is not a 360 role. It is very different from a 360 roles. So if you have questions, feel free to ask questions. Again, if you want a topic to be covered for next week, feel free to drop me a line, drop me an email and send me something as a topic to cover. Otherwise, I'll pick my topic myself, maybe a topic you don't want, but that's my choice, not yours. So if you want a topic that you want, feel free to send me your topic and I'll create something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. I've been Howard Greenwood and this is Love Work Life. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much.